Good afternoon. Welcome to the on-demand content at Pass Forward 2022. I am Lauren Cohen, Associate Director of Government Relations at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's session. Support telling the full American story through efforts to reauthorize the Historic Preservation Fund. Today, we'll hear from five speakers. First, you'll hear from myself and my colleague, Hannah Stark from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Then we'll hear from three dynamic leaders in historic preservation about their recent success stories in securing grants to tell the full American story in their communities and states. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Hannah Stark. Hannah is the Policy Communications Coordinator at the National Trust. Hannah, can you kick things off and provide an overview of the Historic Preservation Fund? Thanks, Lauren. It's really hard to overstate the importance of the Historic Preservation Fund to communities across the country. I'm going to provide you with a little bit of background on its history. Congress established the Historic Preservation Fund in 1976 to support the initiatives mandated by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. This act laid out the basic framework of the preservation field that we all know today. It created a partnership between the federal, state, tribal, and local governments to preserve historic properties and cultural resources. It called upon governors to appoint a state historic preservation officer and tribal leaders to appoint a tribal historic preservation officer, SHPOs and TIPOs, respectively. The act also established the National Register of Historic Places and National Historic Landmark Programs, which designate historic properties of national, state, and local significance. Many of you are probably familiar with Section 106 of the Act, which requires federal agencies to take into account the effects of their actions on historic properties by identifying them, assessing adverse effects, and resolving those effects. The Act was the catalyst to formalize and professionalize the historic preservation field for all of us. A decade after the Act's passage, Senator Henry M. Jackson of Washington State sponsored an amendment to enhance the Act. One of the key provisions was the establishment of the Historic Preservation Fund, a dedicated funding source to carry out the provisions of the 1966 Act. Until the Historic Preservation Fund was established, the mandates of the Act were unfortunately severely underfunded. The amendment also coincided with our nation's bicentennial, which brought a heightened sense of pride and desire to preserve our nation's heritage. The HPF is a trust fund in the U.S. Treasury funded by Outer Continental Shelf oil and gas lease revenues. Since 1980, $150 million has been deposited annually within the fund and is available for congressional appropriations. The idea was to use revenues generated through the exploitation of one non-renewable source oil and gas reserves to fund the protection of another, our nation's heritage. The HPF is uniquely structured and does not use taxpayer dollars. Originally, the funding was intended just for SHPOs, but later grew to include local governments in the, 1990, in the 1980s and tribal governments in the 1990s. The program's authorized level has remained constant at $150 million since its inception, although adjusted for inflation, $150 million in 1980 is the equivalent of more than $537 million today. The Historic Preservation Fund has guided federal investment and engagement in historic preservation activity for almost 50 years now. I hope you can see that its contribu contributions to our nation's fabric are far reaching and long lasting. I'm now going to provide you with an overview of HPF's grant programs. The National Park Service administers the HPF on behalf of the Secretary of the Interior. Funds are dispersed through an apportionment formula and as competitive grants. State and tribal historic preservation offices receive annual block grants using an apportionment formula to assist in expanding and accelerating their historic preservation activities. These appropriations provide essential operational funding for these offices to fulfill their duties in the National Historic Preservation Act. SHPO funding is divided between the 50 states, five territories, three freely associated states of Micronesia and the District of Columbia. SHPOs are required to provide a 40% match to their awarded funding, and at least 10% of each SHPO's funding must be subgranted to certified local governments, or CLGs. CLGs are local governments whose preservation programs have been endorsed by the state and the National Park Service as meeting national historic preservation standards. These grants leverage local matches to support preservation projects such as surveys, National Register nominations, preservation education, and community planning. 
The National Park Service Tribal Preservation Program designates tribes that have signed agreements with the National Park Service as approved TIPOs. A TIPO assumes the functions and responsibilities of a SHPO on tribal lands to protect and conserve important cultural and historic assets. In addition to the important role of funding state and tribal historic preservation offices, the HPF also supports competitive grant programs to preserve and document diverse histories. Competitive grants are appropriated by Congress from the HPF for specific grant programs. These programs address a wide variety of preservation needs across the country and fund various types of work. In recent years, more competitive grant programs have been created to celebrate the diversity of our nation and the histories of underrepresented communities. This fiscal year, fiscal year 2022, seven competitive grant programs are funded, totaling $84 million. Several of these grant programs focus on specific communities that have been underrepresented in our historical narrative. They are starred on screen, and I will br briefly mention each. You will also hear from three grant recipients shortly of their experiences. One of the largest programs is the African American Civil Rights Grants. Usually 50 or, si 50 or 60 grants are awarded each year. The goal is to document, interpret, and preserve sites related to African American struggle through the transatlantic slave trade all the way until the modern civil rights movement. This grant is also now open and accepting applications until November 8th, 2022. A relatively new and still growing program is the History of Equal Rights. It is a bit of a spin-off of the African American Civil Rights Program, the idea being this grant is instead focused on all American civil rights struggles. Another program focused on diversity with a healthy amount of funding is the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Program. It works to preserve National Register listed and eligible buildings on accredited HBCU campuses. Next is a small dollar program with big impacts across the country, the Underrepresented Community Grant Program. It provides funding to SHPOs, TIPOs, and CLGs to survey and nominate properties associated with communities currently underrepresented in the National Register and National Historic Landmark programs. It can also be used to amend older, nom older nominations that overlook uh, common histories. The HPF is one of the most widely supported and high-performing federal grant programs. It has breathed life into long untold stories that help communities protect places that form our cultural identities. Again, I want to reiterate the National Park Service administers these programs. The National Trust is just a committed advocate and supporter of the programs. If you're interested in applying and learning more about program eligibility, please visit the National Park Service Historic Preservation webpage. And Lauren, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Hannah. Well, with that excellent background, I'm going to provide an overview of the appropriations process and a brief history of HPF funding levels. So you may have heard the saying that Congress holds the purse strings of the government and the appropriations process is primarily how that happens. Both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate have 12 appropriations subcommittees, funding everything from defense, rural development, homeland security, to the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Park Service, and the Historic Preservation Fund. Each subcommittee writes the legislation that allocates federal funds to numerous government agencies, departments, and organizations on an annual basis. Uh, the subcommittees who hold jurisdiction over the Department of Interior, and thus the National Park Service and the HPF, is the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies. I've listed the current members of those subcommittees in both the House and the Senate here. Take a moment to review this list, and if you have a member of Congress listed here, know that they hold a good deal of power when it comes to making early decisions on funding levels for the HPF. Advocating to all members of Congress is important, but if you are represented by one of these members, your advocacy for the HPF is key. We'll talk about ways to advocate a little bit later. To give you an idea of how the appropriation cycle carries out, here is what a typical year looks like. And I say typical with a pretty big asterisk. You, you honestly never know how the appropriation cycle is really gonna play out, but this is what we typically see. So in January and February of each year, the process really starts with the administration. So federal agencies provide a budget proposal to OMB or the Office of Management and Budget, budget and then the president's budget request is released. Now, I always like to note that the president's budget request is just that, it's a request. 
It's what the president and the rest of the administration would like to see in the budget for the coming fiscal year. It is not exactly what we see for the fiscal year. As a reminder, the, the, um, that uh, privilege is held by Congress, not by the administration. So in March and April, the U.S. House subcommittees receive uh, testimony from outside organizations. They hold hearings and they write that initial legislation uh, with those initial numbers of what they would like to see each agency or department or um, program funded at. In May and June, the U.S. House Full Appropriations Committee votes on the subcommittee legislation. So now we've gone from subcommittee to full committee. Uh, in July, the entire U.S. House votes on appropriations packages. So uh, this would mean that every single member of the United States House of Representat Representatives, so all 435 members, actually get to vote on these appropriations packages. That also means that any member of Congress can propose an amendment to these packages. Sometimes we see amendments that could be harmful to funding for the HPF, but sometimes we see amendments that can be helpful uh, from someone who doesn't serve on the Appropriations Committee and wasn't able to offer that amendment early in the process. Uh, also in July, we start to see the U.S. Senate subcommittees receive testimony, hold hearings, and write legislation. So the U.S. Senate starts their process uh, later in the summer, whereas the U.S. House starts it early in the spring. By September, the U.S. Senate Full Appropriations Committee votes on subcommittee legislation, but it's important to note here that the end of the fiscal year is on September 30th. So, you know, if you don't see uh, all of this wrapped up by September 30th, which it rarely is, uh, we'll see something called a continuing resolution or a CR, and that's triggered to be able to finish this work. So when you see a CR, um, you know, that, that really means that they haven't had the time to finish the work before September 30th. And if they were to uh, not have a CR, that would mean that the, uh, the government would technically run out of money uh, or uh, shut down, basically. So they need to have a, a CR triggered to make sure that they can finish that work. Um, by October and December, understanding that we're probably in a CR period at this point, the entire U.S. Senate votes on the appropriations packages. Uh, final passed House and Senate bills are then sent to conference. Usually, House and Senate bills uh, for appropriations dollars are a little bit different. They're not always exactly the same amount of money um, for each program or um, uh, department or anything like that. So they have to go to what we call a conference, which means that those differences are hashed out. Um, when that's completed, final passage by both chambers needs to happen, and then the president signs that appropriations bill into law. Um, also something that can happen in the appropriations process is report language is included. You may have heard this term before. Um, and really what this means is that appropriators are, are providing some policy direction in addition to um, how much money to spend. Um, report language shows how they would prefer the money to be spent. Um, so they're, they're able to put in a little bit of policy direction there. Now, again, as I said, all of this comes with a lot of caveats. Some years, no CR is required since both chambers finish their work before September 30th. This, unfortunately, is exceedingly rare. In fact, it's only happened four times since 1977. So if no funding bill is passed before the end of a CR, the government shuts down. And many of you are probably more familiar with a government shutdown than uh, an appropriations package that is passed by September 30th. Now, I'll also note that CRs are less than ideal uh, in terms of continuing to fund the government because it keeps the funding from the previous year intact, which if you've seen an increase in funding during the appropriations process, that means that you're under that lower level of funding for longer. This is especially worrisome when rumors of a full year CR start to crop up. Now, uh, for the past several years, the National Trust has produced an appropriations report dealing, detailing the agreed upon asks from a coalition of national historic preservation uh, organizations for the coming fiscal year. 
We deliver this report to every single congressional office on the Hill, including committee staff, to provide a clear justification for increases and other needs from the field. This report has become a key advocacy tool to demonstrate the incredible work happening across the country and the ways in which increased funding could further that work. On the right is a listing of all of the recent funding levels for various programs, as well as the field's FY 2023 ask. Uh, I know that's very small there and you can't read it now, but I do encourage you to check out the uh, appropriations report for yourself because it uh, details so much incredible work that's happening uh, across the country and across so many different programs. Now, let's take a little closer look at the recent funding history for the HPF. As Hannah mentioned, $150 million is deposited annually into a fund at the Treasury, but only the current fiscal year has the funding for the HPF Ever, if ever even been met and then exceeded uh, that $150 million mark. It's important to note that uh, the $150 million mark is not a cap. Um, it's certainly not a cap. It's just the amount that's deposited each year. And frankly, uh, as I said, so many years have passed where we have not reached $150 million for the HPF. Um, so we're well under that, uh, the amount that could be appropriated uh, for the Historic Preservation Fund. The steady growth in funding and continued need among SHPOs, TIPOs, and the competitive grant programs yielded our ask for uh, fiscal year 2023 to be $200 million. You can see that there. You'll note here that the uh, final enacted level for FY 2020 was $118.6 million, and compare that to just two years later for a final enacted level of just over $173 million for the current fiscal year. This is a huge amount of growth showing that we have excellent advocates who have connected with true congressional champions on Capitol Hill. Now, here's a look at the full trajectory of funding for the HPF since FY 1968. You'll notice several periods of steady growth, along with some peaks and valleys, often corresponding with uh, periods of recession in our country as well. But you can see that we are on a, a steady climb up, and we hope to continue that trend uh, in the next several years. Um, but now we'd like to hear from a few recipients of various Historic Preservation Fund competitive grant programs. First up is Judith Wilman, a principal investigator at Historical New York Research Associates and a professor emerita at the State University of New York at Oswego. She is currently the president of the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum. Judith, can you provide us with some insight on the recent History of Equal Rights grant that you received? Thank you so much, Lauren. It is a delight to be here to support the Historic Preservation Fund. We absolutely could not do this work without you. And uh, thank you so much for doing this panel. The 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House looked like this in 2007. Next slide. And in spite of that awful condition, a small group of local people decided they wanted to save this building. Why would anyone looking at this building think it was worth saving? And it's because it is so important to the national story of equal rights for all people in this country. Next slide. So this presentation will talk a bit about why this meeting house is important nationally, how it got to be in the shape that it's in, and how this all-volunteer local group is saving this building for the future. Next slide. It's important both architecturally and historically. As you can see, it's a traditional Quaker meeting house with a broad side to the street, two front doors, one for men, one for women. This one is exceptionally large. It was designed to hold a thousand people for what Quakers called their annual meetings in June for 25 Quaker meetings across Western New York and Canada. It's probably the largest pre-canal building in Western New York. Farmington is located near the Erie Canal built in 1825 and the railroads in 1840s 
And these new transportation systems created a revolution in bringing people into this area, which was both rich in agricultural lands and rich in industrial sites. Farmington was at the epicenter of what people called um, the burned over district or the psychic highway of upstate New York because so many religious and reform movements emerged in this period. Next. Movements for equal rights, especially focusing on African Americans, Native Americans, and women, flourished amidst this turmoil. These movements were rooted in both secular and religious traditions. Next. As Americans, people believed in the Declaration of Independence. They knew it by heart. They heard it recited every year on the 4th of July. We hold these truths to be self-evident. It said that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Next slide. Many reformers also rooted their belief system in religious traditions, in this case Christianity, and they often quoted biblical verses such as the one from Galatians, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Quakers especially were um, susceptible to equal rights movements because they believed that there was that of God in everyone. And as George Fox, the founder, said, walk cheerfully over the earth, answering that of God and everyone. Farmington Equal Rights focused on three basic groups, African Americans, Native Americans, and women. Next slide. African Americans came to the Farmington area as part of the larger abolitionist movement and also on the Underground Railroad. And there were dozens and perhaps hundreds of people who came through the Farmington area on the Underground Railroad, including some well-known African-American leaders, such as Austin Stewart, William Wells Brown, the Edmondson sisters, Frederick Douglass. Native Americans came to Farmington with a request that Quakers become allies in the fight they had to maintain their homelands in Western New York. They were determined not to have a trail of tears for the Haudenosaunee people as the Cherokee Choctaw Creeks had had uh, that same summer. They were fighting against the Treaty of Buffalo Creek, which mandated that all Haudenosaunee people move west of the Mississippi. Seneca people, the largest and westernmost part of the Haudenosaunee nations, refused to leave and at their request, they had many councils with Quakers, both at the Farmington Meeting House and Cattaraugus and elsewhere. The work that they did resulted in keeping three of their four major homelands. Women also found a haven in Farmington and support for equal rights. There were among Quakers a tradition of women being treated with respect and having political as well as um, individual, personal, spiritual power. That led them to become helpful when Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the catalyst in Seneca Falls, decided she wanted to create a convention solely to discuss the rights of women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the catalyst, but the Quakers were the real organizers. And at that convention, they adopted a document called the Declaration of Sentiments that was patterned after the Declaration of Independence. Except saying all men are created equal, this document said all men and women are created equal. Of the 100 people who signed that declaration, about a quarter of them were Quakers affiliated with the Farmington Quaker Meeting House. Next slide. So what happened to this building, such an important national center for equal rights for people of color, Native Americans, women? Why did it get into such terrible condition? Well, like many people in rural upstate New York after the Civil War, Farmington Quakers went west or they went to urban areas for better jobs and new opportunities. So the, the people associated with this meeting house began literally to leave town. Next slide. 
1927, the remaining Quakers sold this meeting house to John Van Lair, a local farmer, who decided to turn it into a barn. And to do that, he took out every other window. He raised the first floor to create a second floor. He took the dividers that had separated the men's and women's meetings, made a little room upstairs. So he kept the original pieces of the meeting house, but he put them all in different places. And further, he moved the meeting house 325 feet east down the road. Next slide. By the late 20th century, this meeting house was clearly falling into extreme disrepair. It was so bad um, after a woman ran her car into the post and cracked it and the whole wall bay fell off that the Farmington Town Board mandated, mandated that it be demolished. Next slide. This local group decided and that, that that was not going to happen. And they went every meeting to the Farmington Town Board and convinced the Farmington Town Board to support trying to save this building because of its historic importance. We had a lot of support from the town of Farmington, Farmington Friends Church, town historians, county historians, Landmark Society, uh, Finger Lakes Tourism, and statewide we found support from the Historic Preservation Office and the Preservation League of New York State and Humanities New York as well. Next slide. We also had some clear guidelines for ourselves and they dealt with our mission. They dealt with authenticity and research to carry that out with knowing our audiences, with developing some methods that helped reach those audiences with our mesh mission message, and with finding the resources to carry out this enormous project. Next slide. We stick to our mission in spite of changing political context, and we think about what do we want to convey to the world. We decided that we wanted to maintain and preserve and interpret this building as a national site of conscience, a cornerstone of historic movements for equal rights, social justice, and peace, including rights for Native Americans, African Americans, and women. And we invite visitors to explore these issues of equality and justice in their own lives and in our own world. Next. We recognize the value of authenticity. This site, as all historic sites, are unique. We try very hard to be true to the reality of what actually happened here. To do that, we did serious research, extensive research in primary sources, published in 2017, a historic structure report, which really outlines the basic importance of this building historically with an echoes in our own time. Next. We pay particular attention to our audiences and we attract people of all ages from kids to senior citizens. We attract most people from European American backgrounds, but some native and African people of African backgrounds. And our programs always deal with people of color and with the reform movements that uh, allied all three of these groups together. We try when our audiences arrive to meet them where they are and to create a space of safety where they can feel free to talk to other people who may not look like themselves, to learn, to think, and to begin to shape the world that we'd all like to live in of respect and justice for everyone. Next. To do this, we do two basic kinds of work. One is our, and we have been extraordinarily grateful to Humanities New York for funding programs over many years. All of them deal with equal rights. We focus especially on Native Americans, African Americans, and women, both past and present, to carry out our mission. And they also help us expand our audiences. Because we don't have an appropriate meeting place at the moment, the building is unrestored, we have made links with local historical societies and museums and historic sites 
and we meet with them to help expand our own audience and also expand their audience. Next. Our second major focus has been on restoring this building. About 85% of the original fabric of this building still exists. With help from our architects, John G. Wade Associates, we have stabilized this building. We've repaired its framing structure. Next. We've moved it across the road and we had a celebration that included Peter Jemison, uh, Seneca, and uh, re um, reenactment of Susan B. Anthony and Quakers. Next. And we restored its North Bay in 2018 so that it now has its full uh, size that it originally had. Next. The resources to do this have not been easy, as you can imagine, to find. We have been so reliant on local people and private donations, but there is no way that a project of this size could be funded without federal and state money. New York State helped us in the early years with an environmental protection fund of $330,000. We had to match that with private and federal monies. Private donors included the National Trust for Historic Preservation with an emergency grant early on, 1772 Foundation, the Rochester Area Community Foundation, and many, many private people. But we could not do this without help from federal sources. The National Park Service's Network to Freedom helped with two key grants early on, and the Historic Preservation Fund with the Equal Rights Program is going to help us finish this restoration. It, it would not be possible to do this kind of work without the Historic Preservation Fund, and that allows us to use federal monies also then for state and local and private matches. We've raised so far $1.2 million. Next. Thanks to all this support, this meeting house stands today protected on its site, covered with T111 siding to protect the clapboards, ready for full restoration, which we will do with this Historic Preservation Equal Rights Grant money. Thanks to everyone who has faith in this project, and it seems almost like a miracle to us that we are able to do this and that we are going to put it over the top with the help of the Historic Preservation Fund. So thanks to the Historic Preservation Fund. Thanks to you all for coming. Turn Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Nicholas Van, the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for Washington State. Nicholas, we're excited to hear details on the underrepresented community grants the Washington Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation has received. So I'll pass it off to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you also for having me on this panel. It's really a pleasure to um, share all of these stories uh, with all of you. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, I'm Nicholas Van. I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, which is the SHPO in Washington State. And I first wanted to start by explaining a little bit about myself, because uh, I feel like my identity and my lived experience are a primary motivator that explains the perspectives that I'm going to describe today. Uh, I'm a Chinese American, and I've had to teach myself much of that history because it wasn't taught in school. But that's another story for another day. My family's been here for multiple generations. My family's roots are all over the rural Western towns. However, I think we can do a better job at reflecting my family's history, Chinese American history, and the often difficult uh, immigrant history as well in the historic built environment. The history resulted in prolific built legacies and increased acknowledgement and understanding of such is fully supported by the underrepresented communities grant program, which is part of the HPF funding. I know a lot of people feel the same way, and we share this uh, kind of sentiment with the importance surrounding the URC grant program. In general, I'd say such resources are definitely a risk of full erasure. That's for a number of reasons, um, which I won't get into right now. Um, but I know that we have to document and understand before we can preserve and protect. And if we fail to act now to document these places and connect the people living today in these places to the history and significance 
in the presence of the people that came before us, then we're going to lose them. And they're not renewable resources, which is really important to keep in mind when you're putting on a preservation lens and understanding the importance of doing the things that we do. This is one of the many things that motivates me uh, and helps facilitate that sense of belonging that I feel like everybody deserves, uh, no matter where you live or who you are, uh, but especially for people of color like me or people with hidden identities uh, and so on. Now, I want to speak about the impacts overall of the Underrepresented Communities Grant Program has had, uh, not so much on the content. I definitely encourage you to explore further. Um, if you hit next, uh, we can start cycling through and it'll start playing um, some images of some of the places that we've been able to find uh, through this program. Uh, one of the most important things about the Underrepresented Communities Grant Program is that it puts people first. And in my view, this is the way that it uh, has always been and should always be people-centric. Uh, government and public service, uh, I also strongly believe should be this way, uh, and it is in a lot of cases. Uh, and I'm also very lucky and I'd say proud to work in a place that aligns with my personal values on this. We've taken full advantage of the underrepresented community grant program offerings. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of outreach and survey for the Latino community in both rural Eastern Washington and in the Seattle area. Uh, we're currently working on a statewide survey in context for Filipino American history uh, with the Filipino American National Historical Society. Uh, and that encompasses also a huge amount of agricultural and labor history. Uh, we also have an ongoing project for uh, Black creators to survey and document the vast contributions of Black and African American architects, engineers, artists, builders, etc. Uh, that project is being led by Monette Hearn from Guided Methods and Ellen Miro with the Johnson Partnership. And now we're just beginning to work on documenting the fragile existence of historic places from the Chinese exclusion area. If Chinese exclusion era, which obviously is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so excited to un start undertaking that work. For the Washington SHPO, uh, this grant program has really always transcended uh, simply documenting the history of many marginalized communities uh, and increasing the representation and survey in National Register nominations. I think that the real long-term sustainable impacts of this of a grant program like this go well beyond the deliverables, which are really important, obviously, but I feel like the long-term goals um, and relationships that are established really transcend uh, you know, the program um, and kind of take it to that place where uh, it has this really important um, meaning for a lot of folks. Uh, it goes beyond simply increasing representation in the natural register. Uh, through all of our grant-funded work, we've really intended to set the table for everybody uh, we have begun to interact with. We want to bring them in, but also listen to understand how preservation may be approached differently from various perspectives. Uh, personally, I've gotten tired of hearing things like, well, we don't know that history because they've never come asking us for help. Uh, and I also got tired of government saying to someone, uh, you know, that's bringing forward a nomination that we can't acknowledge that history and significance uh, because of something uh, that might have changed over time. Uh, you know, maybe somebody totally unrelated to that history um, covered up the building with uh, vinyl siding or replaced the windows 20 years ago, uh, or the inside got remodeled a dozen times. You know, we've, we've seen it all with buildings that, you know, have been around for quite a while. Of course, things are going to change. Things always change and buildings continue to evolve. Um, but that doesn't take anything away from the cultural or historic significance of the community of people that affected that building and are part of that history and ingrained into the actual fabric that, that composes them. So what, in my opinion, are the true outcomes of the underrepresented communities grants, particularly in Washington state? Uh, again, I, I think that they really transcend increasing numbers on the National Register. Uh, and I think that the quantitative data uh, is not quite a true barometer of reaching equity and preservation. Because uh, if, pe if people don't feel like their stories and places are fully represented in the National Register or in the recognition of historic significance through historic preservation, then I think we have a real problem. Uh, people need to feel like they belong like their places and their story and their history matters because it does. Everyone is entitled to feel like they belong wherever there are, whether they've been there for five minutes or five generations. And the grant program um, 
really truly facilitates this. They, they, it helps us build relationships with the people and the organizations that haven't necessarily been included in the past, or maybe they have been included, um, but there haven't been equitable outcomes because we haven't exactly examined or overhauled processes with an inclusive and fully representative lens towards equity. Uh, so we have a lot of in that arena, and because we're able to forge these relationships with many communities, uh, I think that we're building a much stronger movement uh, in terms of uh, uh, relevance and, and meaning of historic preservation practice in this country. Uh, some of the most recent success that we've had uh, were spurred by two rounds of survey and documentation for Washington's Latino community. Through that work, we were introduced to Jesus Sanchez. Uh, he's a prominent figure in the Latino community here in Washington. Um, but we were also very clear at the beginning of that project and assertive that Latino farm labor history in particular uh, in the Yakima Valley was important and significant and uh, it matters in Washington state history. So we were able to raise awareness around resources previously ignored or taken for granted um, by ourselves and even by the Latino community um, and now uh, Jesus actually serves as the chair of our State Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. So uh, building that relationship has in fact had a sustainable impact um, uh, by having him chair our, uh, our advisory council. And it's been great to be able to work with him over the week, over the years. Uh, we've also listed two critically important sites as part of the, um, that survey work, uh, El Centro de la Raza and Chief Self High School in Seattle. Uh, El Centro is really uh, fascinating to me. Uh, it started as Beacon Hill Elementary in Seattle, uh, but it was later occupied by civil rights activists. And then it was transformed into El Centro in the early 1970s. Uh, now we all see elementary schools um, in our communities. They're super important and vital um, community gathering places in our neighborhoods, in our urban landscapes. They oftentimes have architectural significance as well. Um, but they're, you know, fairly common resource type. Uh, to me, what sets this apart, though, is that there's only one El Centro. There's only one El Centro de la Raza. And there's many El Centros in other cities and places and states. Um, but what sets this place apart was that later history, that occupation by civil rights activists um, and the stories that it had to tell and the continued uh, relevance that El Centro still has today uh, in Seattle. And, you know, it's, it's significance and its place in Seattle and Washington state history, uh, and even in the nation's history for that matter, I'd say it rivals any other landmark. Uh, we've learned a lot um, with, with all of our underrepresented communities grants, uh, and also that they're truly endangered species, as I mentioned before. Uh, I think that they're endangered because of ownership issues and the fact that many communities of color were specifically unable to own property in the past. Um, we've identified countless resources with historic integrity that's tied to setting, feeling, and association. And I think this really speaks to the fact that every building has a story to tell. Every district, every neighborhood, every place. And we need to know from the community what's significant. I often refer to the phrase, nothing about us without us, uh, because you can't tell uh, someone else's stories. Uh, you know, you can't tell someone that their stories don't matter. You need to know what someone's story is through their voice. And that's really critically important uh, to inject into, into projects like this so that we're not just surveying the built environment, trying to understand and gain a deep understanding without the community involvement as well. And because we're able to partner with community and to develop these narratives and document these places, that's what builds a sustainable relationship. Uh, we've also learned that using a people-centric approach to our relationship building uh, and project management resonates really loudly with the communities we serve. We keep hearing feedback over and over about uh, how important a project like this is, how important it is to survey, uh, to build a context statement, uh, to identify places of significance um, on that community's terms, um, has a lot of meaning to them. Uh, people have emotional attachments to place. We all know that as preservationists. That's what we've been saying for decades uh, since the modern preservation movement was, uh, was born. Uh, and it's so incredibly true. And a lot of people have emotional attachments to place and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it can exist anywhere. It's pretty, a fairly ubiquitous thing. Um, but in our view, the, place, the places that uh, you know, have this significance 
they wouldn't exist uh, and they wouldn't have the character and the soul without the people themselves. So places have been able to convey their history, their soul, their culture for generations. And our ability to capture that through these grants has been really, really rewarding because we're learning so much about our people and our diverse history. And it just adds so much uh, layers and value um, to everybody that we're able to serve. So I just wanted to leave uh, briefly with some closing thoughts um, that you know we need to be able to continue doing this work because it's so important and because it matters so much to people. And there's also so much that we need to learn still uh, and to help continue facilitating that sense of belonging in all communities that we have. Uh, as we grow these relationships, as we create trust, acknowledgement, understanding, uh, particularly with underrepresented communities, we start to understand that we've only just scratched the surface and that there's an endless amount of things that we can continue to learn. Uh, I'll also say that the competitive grant program is very competitive. Um, people are very hungry for this type of work uh, because of how important it is. Um, the, community, the underrepresented communities grants uh, have been transformative in Washington. And I think as long as they're available, we're gonna keep applying for them because it's a priority for us. It's one of those things that I value the most about my job because it's so, it's so incredibly rewarding. But I think it also importantly asserts that the SHPO cares about the people that we serve and that the, peop that the history we're documenting is significant, it is legitimate, and it belongs in that full, true American story. We still have a lot more work to do uh, in order to continue being fully inclusive. Uh, we have to listen first, bring people in, um, you know, everybody deserves a, to be able to participate in preservation. As a public servant, I feel like it's my duty to serve all Washingtonians, and that is regardless of how you identify. You know, if you call yourself a Washingtonian, you're the you are who I serve. And you know, specifically through these grant programs, we've begun, uh, you know, serving our Filipino Americans, our Black Washingtonians, our Latino, Latino, Latinx Washingtonians people with disabilities, you know, things that are further on the list uh, in the future, because the wish list is continues to grow and will continue to grow as long as we're able to do this work. Um, you know, people with varying socioeconomic status, LGBTQ Washingtonians, et cetera, et cetera. It's my duty to serve them uh, as a deputy SHPO, and it's our duty as a SHPO to serve the people that we do. Uh, it's also important to learn the hard truths about those lived experiences so that we can get an authentic picture of what that history actually is. But that's also what makes everybody's respective community unique and vital. And so with all that being said, uh, just really appreciate having the opportunity to be able to document these stories, to be able to cultivate these relationships. Uh, and it's all made possible through the underrepresented communities grant program, but also just you know HPF funding in general, which funds uh, a good chunk of operating uh, for a lot of, for all the shippos and territories throughout the country, uh, and we wouldn't be able to do any of this work if it weren't for the HPF fund. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I really appreciate that, and for those final thoughts as well. Now we'll hear from John Franco Archimede, the, Ar the Director of Historic Preservation for the City of Patterson, New Jersey, and the Executive Director of Patterson's Historic Preservation Commission. John Franco, can you discuss the African American Civil Rights Grant that you received recently? Uh, first, let me start by saying thank you to the National Trust for inviting this presentation to happen uh, today. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to follow up on the two wonderful projects that were just presented by my co-panelists and also for the city of Patterson to be uh, a grant recipient of this wonderful program that has been so vital to assisting with this, uh, with this project in Patterson, New Jersey. So I'd like to tell you a bit about the project and the significance of the site and of course the grant and the grant program. But as you'll see, as I go through with you, this is a very large project. And I've been working in the city of Patterson for 18 years, and I've been working on this project the whole time. And it's just in the past couple of years that the project has gotten underway full swing to the tune of about 35 to $40 million. So some of the difficulties of presenting the project in a short, concise way, 
I thought about how to give a timeline with bullet points uh, to show the kind of channeling of funding and efforts from various groups and various funding programs to build momentum to where we are today. So I'm going to start with the next slide, please. Inchliffe Stadium is located in Patterson, New Jersey, which was established during George Washington's first administration. We are a very old city, and we have a very direct connection to a founding father, Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was stationed here with George Washington in 1780, and they visited this large waterfall you see right in the middle of the screen called the Great Falls of the Passaic River. And he remembered this waterfall at a time when he was the first Tre uh, Secretary of the Treasury, and he was pondering about the economy for the new nation. Water power, of course, comes to mind when you think of the rushing water over the falls of an entire river emptying its volume, crashing 77 feet down to a lower level. And this happens to also have the, des the distinction of being the largest waterfall east of the Mississippi River, of course, uh, I'm sorry, largest waterfall uh, east of Niagara Falls, um, and only rivaled closely by Rochester Falls in upstate New York. You can see on the slide in front of you that Hinchliffe Stadium is situated right above the falls with a park um, in front of it between the stadium and the falls. And the lower part of the slide to the lower right, you'll see another park area. Clearly, this has been a destination for not only uh, after uh, the establishment of Patterson in the past 250 years, but also for tens of thousands of years previous for indigenous peoples as well. So this slide, I can also uh, uh, tell you that the uh, school above Hinchliffe Stadium, the school number five, built in the 1930s, which will also become important in uh, our later discussion. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of layers of designations and significance uh, that were established by our community uh, and recognized by the National Trust, I'm sorry, the uh, and NPS, and by lately by Congress. On the slide to the uh, left, uh, there's a dashed red line that designates the Great Falls uh, Historic District, which was established in 1970 and entered onto the National Register at that time. After the uh, discussion of a generation uh, in 2009, the green boundary within the red boundary you see on the left is our national park designated or authorized by Congress in 2009, the 397th unit of the national park system called the Great Falls National Historical Park. It consists of about a 50 acre footprint within the larger 115 acre historic district. And as you can see, on the left, the green boundary does not incorporate Hinchliffe Stadium. When it was first designated, not only did the Great Falls Historic District not go around Hinchliffe Stadium, but so the de designation of the National Park also did not. This was changed recently in 2015. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. On the right-hand side, you'll see a more distinct boundary to let you know about the federal lands that are donated, uh, the two park areas directly on either side of the waterfall, the north and south sides, and adjacent to Hinchliffe Stadium. The blue boundaries designate state park lands. In fact, on the upper part of the, of the map, the northern point of the map, um, is the Patterson Vista's great um, uh, New Jersey State Park. Uh, we're working to establish that and develop it uh, presently. Next slide, please. So I'd like to tell you about the stadium itself. The stadium, as you can see on the upper part of the slide here, uh, is a, a photo taken in 1932. Essentially, the opening year of the stadium, you can see the stands are filled with people. We estimate that in these stands, there's also wooden bleachers in the foreground that were built to hold everyone to watch this high school football game. It's the approximately 10,000 spectators to attend this opening game in November of 1932. The stadium project really began in 1929 and 1930 through 
the efforts of the mayor at the time, John V. Hinchliffe, who was really following up and made it his business to uh, bring to fruition a decades-long discussion in Patterson about the need for a civic stadium. You can see at the bottom left, a game is being played on a new field before any of the concrete superstructures were formed. And on the bottom right of the slide, you can see that the unique topography of the site that was chosen starts from a very high elevation and then tapers to a low elevation. The, the stadium or the area was eked out or dug out right from the embankment of the earth. And even before uh, any other of the improvements were made here, they had already laid out a gridiron and built a temporary seating to be able to watch football at this stadium. You can see directly to the north and left of that photo, school number five had not yet been built. School number five was a WPA project built in 1935, uh, just on the other side of this 1930s stadium. So the two of them together are, are a really beautiful preservation um, example. Now, in the center is a model of Hinchliffe Stadium that was created by a local uh, artist, Gaetano Federici. Um, and you can see uh, kind of faintly in that photo, the baseball diamond at center plate, pretty much centered uh, toward the end of the horseshoe of the stadium. This will become important in the next couple of minutes. Now, the next slide, please. So uh, just to recap some of the significance of the stadium, it was constructed in 1932 as a municipal uh, stadium, uh, a center for Patterson's residents, uh, hosting a variety of recreational, cultural, and social events for the city's diverse working population. These included baseball, football, track and field, soccer, boxing, wrestling, motorcycle racing, midget car racing, and entertainment events. A distinctive major attraction, though, was the Negro League Baseball. Next slide, please. So here are some on, on screen, some of the programs from some of the local events that I just mentioned, especially uh, the football games. And many of these football games, uh, like the one on the upper left, Central versus East Side, uh, will demonstrate that the stadium w was largely conceived as a place for our, st our students and young athletes to develop and be engaged in their athletic programming, which was a very important part of the development of our public education concepts at the turn of the century. And uh, at this time, there was a great uh, desire for high schools in large cities like Patterson uh, to have facilities that were significantly large enough to host these uh, a variety of different sporting programs and the overall athletic programs for high schools. Now on the bottom left, there's a bronze plaque also that was done by Gaetano Federici uh, celebrating Eleanor Egg. And this is an example of some of the high school athletes that went on to not only break high school, uh, national high school records at Inchliffe Stadium, uh, but also went on to compete nationally. Uh, at the left, we have the beginnings of Larry Doby, our uh, Patterson native son, uh, who I'll talk about in terms of national significance, but who also played at Inchliffe Stadium was a star athlete in, in, in Patterson High School and played on a diverse number of uh, sports and later and was soon recruited by the Newark Eagles to play baseball to begin his, his career. Um, next slide, please. So going on with the significance other than the local significance that I mentioned that was recognized by the establishment of the stadium on the register individually, in 2004, the stadium is nationally significant uh, for its attraction to Negro League Baseball. From 1932 uh, through 1944, Hinchliffe was an important venue for black baseball, both for independent black teams and for ne the Negro National Leagues. The New York Black Yankees were an important draw of crowds for the stadium and served as a home field variously for the New York Black Yankees the uh, teams of the New York Cubans and the Newark Eagles. The home teams and their opponents brought uh, with them Negro League baseball star players, including Gib Johnson, uh, uh, Oscar Charleston, Leon Day, Cool Papa Bell, and many others. James, of, uh, who were later in, inducted to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Local Hall of Famers Larry Doby and Monty Irvin were scouted by the Newark Eagles at Hinchliffe. 
Within a national context, black baseball played an important role in black America in the early 20th century as part of a greater movement to establish race owned businesses in a segregated society. And by mid century as an important contributor to the advancement of civil rights. Throughout this period, the Negro Leagues provided the nation's, the, the nation's African-Americans with a sense of pride and ownership in which they could permanently display their equal, if not superior, abilities. Within this context, the game and business of Negro Leagues baseball was a prime example of both segregation on the one hand and African-American cultural distinction on the other. While the nation made gestures toward desegregation prior to 1947, the integration of baseball provided to be a dramatic turning point in American history. The signing of Jackie Robinson by the Dodgers into the all-white National League sent shockwaves along the color line drawn by racial segregation in America. Just three months after Robinson's 1947 debut with the Dodgers, Larry Doby, a former Patterson resident who played high school football and baseball as well as semi-pro and professional baseball at the stadium, broke the other color bar barrier in the American League. Among many other outstanding career accomplishments, Doby went on to be the first African American to hit a 400 foot home run in, 19, in the 1948 World Series, resulting in the resonating photograph of Doby and his white teammate, a Cleveland Indians pitcher, Steve Gromick, pressing their heads together in jubilation. So on screen is a, a slide demonstrating some of the graphics for uh, the Negro Leagues period that um, I just uh, talked about and some of the artifacts that are associated with, um, with Hinchliffe Stadium to advertise the uh, um, playing the, the hosting of the uh, Negro Leagues at the stadium. Now, this is a really interesting uh, story because it was really unknown that it would come about like building the stadium uh, didn't have this particular purpose um and on the na on the national scene as we look back toward toward this story uh this uh, site really stands out as a place where we can demonstrate um in a very large way because of the size of the place and because of the significance of baseball as uh the national pastime in america uh the story of segregation and desegregation and the breaking of the color barrier that was mentioned. Uh, so the national significance becomes important later in the designation of this place as a national historic landmark. Next slide, please. So this um, part of, of my presentation for, for you is going to be a timeline of the various preservation milestones over the years. And this will demonstrate, I think, at the toward the end, how the um, grant really helped and assisted in this uh, large scale, long term preservation project. Um, it was really difficult to sometimes think about um, applying for and then receiving preservation grants for such a daunting project because uh, we all knew that it would be a significant dollar uh, value to preserve this place in its entirety and to put it back into operation. So sometimes even a $1 million grant or a $500,000 grant or a $20,000 planning grant, we would, we would be discussing how that could be used in an effective way and in an immediate way to actually demonstrate the communities and the cities and commitment to uh, this project. So, of course, the story begins in 2002 with the, well, before that, I did not mention yet that the stadium um, was regularly used between 1932 and its opening throughout the period of the Negro Leagues uh, playing there. In fact, the distinction also of the, um, of the stadium is it's one of two remaining uh, stadium of its kind in the nation where uh, the Negro Leagues played in this kind of venue. Uh, it also has the distinction now of being the only uh, stadium within the boundaries of the national park, which will come up in this timeline. Uh, so the stadium then went into ownership by the Patterson Public Schools in 1963, and then um, went out of service in 1997, and was serving primarily the Patterson uh, uh, school, school children and the 
uh, programs for the athletic program for the, uh, for the city schools uh, until then. So in 1997, it went out of operation and started to go fallow. And it wasn't long, five years later, that the Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium, a nonprofit, was uh, saved to kind of uh, establish, to kind of bring forward um, the topic of preservation and reuse of the stadium. So right away, the uh, Friends of Hinchliffe applied for a small grant to the uh, Patterson Preservation Commission and to put together the National Register nomination. Uh, it was accepted in 2004. And um, in 2009, another grant uh, uh, opportunity was uh, taken and awarded to the Friends of Finchlow Stadium by the New Jersey Historic Trust for a preservation plan. Also, this, this kind of spurred on the discussion between the owners, the Patterson Public Schools, and the city of Patterson to uh, work together toward the preservation uh, project. Uh, there's some complicated reason why this partnership was so important that I won't get into right now. But the city then sort of took charge of leading the preservation efforts, bringing funding forward uh, to lay the groundwork for the stadium's preservation. You can see in 2009, the Great Falls National Historic Park was established. And in 2010, the Hinchliffe Stadium um, Friends Group uh, applied to, based on the preservation plan, a, a capital um, improvements grant to the uh, New Jersey Historic Trust for $500,000, which was granted. Uh, the NPS, um, as part of the legislation designating the park, the NPS funded a uh, National Historic Landmark study for the stadium. And in 2013, the study resulted in successful listing of the stadium as a National Historic Landmark. So this is the highest level of designation that a cultural designation that a place can have. And this puts it on par with places like the Statue of Liberty or Congress Hall or the White House, for example. In 2014, um, the National Trust started to convene with us ongoing leadership meetings in Patterson. They had been to the stadium. They were invited by the Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium to come and um, to bring more attention and national attention to this, um, this uh, significant place. Um, was successful in bringing the stadium as one of the top 11 most endangered, in, uh, uh, endangered places in the nation on the 2009 list. So it was really uh, uh, in, with the trust's involvement with Patterson and convening these leadership meetings that uh, the project really started to take more momentum forward. Um, and you can see, next slide please, that the uh, National Trust also partnered with the, uh, with the city to create a community day, a Save Hinchliffe Stadium Day, where hundreds of members of the community came out and uh, cleaned up Hinchliffe Stadium, painted it, and the uh, city of Patterson DPW removed all of the uh, trees and vegetation that had been growing up in the stadium. Uh, you can see in 2015 on this side that the boundaries of the national park were changed to include Inchliff Stadium by an act of Congress. Um, in 2016, the business plan was um, contracted and developed. And through our association with the National Trust in 2016, um, a private donation, our first private donation from the American Express Foundation uh, came toward our pilot project. So um, we were discussing with the uh, National Trust during, our, um, during this period what we could do with $500,000 from the New Jersey Historic Trust and with the grant from uh, American Express. This resulted in a pilot project uh, and a con actual construction on the facade of the stadium at 1.3 million and the city of Patterson bonded funding to also have um, a demonstration that the community was behind this project. The point here was to start rehabilitation on the facade of the building where some of the most uh, significant architectural features existed to show everyone of uh, the, the cities, the school districts, the uh, national foundations that came to work with uh, Patterson in partnership there sort of dedication to moving this project forward. Um, and at that time, with that momentum, was the grant application uh, to the NPS for the African-American Civil Rights Sites. Uh, the NHL nomination that I talked to you about specifically de uh, designated the stadium uh, as nationally significant for its association at, uh, with uh, African-American uh, African -American Civil Rights, um, which made this grant project, um, this grant uh, application um, a, a really key 
uh, winner. Uh, we were very proud to be uh, among uh, 50, 50 grant awards uh, in 24 states. Um, and of those awards, uh, I believe there were only six that were awarded the maximum dollar figure, which was $500,000. So we're very proud of that um, as far as the NPS grant. Uh, to match this, $200,000 was brought by the county to create a $700,000 of a continuation of a pilot project for the other side of Hinchliffe Stadium, the west side of Hinchliffe Stadium. I'm going to demonstrate this to you in photos in just a minute. Uh, this led to um, awareness um, and uh, activity, around, as, as was desired, activity around of the larger project really taking off. And you can see in 2019, a developer's agreement was ratified for the overall, overall rehab project. Throughout 2020, uh, there was sort of a, comp a complicated set of compliance that had to be met, donation of lands, financing, subdivisions, HP compliance reviews. Also, this project was a winner of the um, uh, National Park Service's uh, a National Store Tax Credit Program, which uh, we're using also very successfully here. Uh, the groundbreaking for the project, the developers, by the way, um, were a very unique uh, combination of by Adolfo Wilson, a, a Pattersonian, a Patter Patterson native, who played um, in the stadium, went to school in Patterson, and uh, a large developer in, um, in New Jersey, uh, RPM Development. The groundbreaking came on December 20th, 21st, 2021, and uh, the, it's currently under construction. Uh, this project will be ready to go, uh, fully rehabilitated as a historic place where uh, as many as 30,000 uh, Pattersonians, Patterson children will be able to have the experience of playing uh, in Hinchliffe Stadium, practicing in Hinchliffe Stadium, and participating in the same way that their parents did, and in some cases, also their grandparents. Next slide, please. So with all that said, uh, now some photos to take you through quickly. Uh, this is the, the stadium in its uh, state in about 2012. You can see the uh, 1992 uh, original AstroTurf field that had replaced the uh, grass field is all torn up and in heaps. Uh, vegetation is growing everywhere and there's a lot of neglect. Next slide, please. Again, various views from the same period. Uh, please take a look at the view in the upper right corner. This is the facade of pilot project area, uh, the front of Hinchliffe Stadium. It measures 450 feet long. Uh, it consists of four ticket booths of which you can see one. And the project area was the four ticket booths and this entire facade for rehabilitation on the exterior. Uh, at the lower left, you can see the, the uh, state of some of the custom terracotta tiles. At the ticket booth windows, there are a lot of them that are missing, and this, uh, this kind of uh, restoration was also needed during this project. Next slide, please. Now, this is the photo of the stadium in 2014 after the community cleanup day, as I mentioned earlier, um, that uh, the community came and painted the stadium. Our DPW removed the vegetation, and you can see the dramatic dis the difference in the slides that it just showed you from its uh, previous condition to uh, after this one-day event, only one-day event. Uh, above is school number five that I mentioned earlier, uh, built as a WPA project in 1935, a great companion to uh, the stadium. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a view of the pilot project getting started. Uh, first, all of the paint, lead paint was removed from the facade. Next. Uh, and then almost with surgical precision, precision along this wall, all of the deficiencies in the rebar uh, and the rust jacking areas, uh, spalled areas were identified, uh, carefully cut out, the rebar retreated, and then repacked, and then the whole thing recoded. Next slide. And here's, a, uh, here's a, an image of the final uh, product uh, for the wall section. Next slide, please. And here's a reminder of some of the conditions of the ticket booths and some of the unique terracotta artwork and features, including the loss of the 
a terracotta uh, uh, Roman tile roof that you can see in the lower right. Next slide. This demonstrates the rest of the restored areas that I just showed you. Many of the tiles and the smaller square tiles in the lower uh, photo had to actually be re remade or you know, uh, made from scratch basically to match uh, closely with the originals that have a more hazy appearance. Next slide, please. Of course, I couldn't go by without showing you the overall project underway. This is the entire stadium. It will seat uh, close to 7,000 people. Uh, all of the uh, seating areas will be bleacher style, just like it was, but they will be uh, up to code in terms of their uh, stairs that ca ca convey people in and out. It's completely handicapped accessible uh, with special seating areas and, uh, available, as well as all the conveyance areas uh, to allow uh, for special access. Uh, so you can see this view is looking again back toward the rear of the seating bowl and school number five prominently sits uh, at, at the north end. And that would be the, um, the front facade. The four ticket booths you can see as well identified by their red roofs. Next slide, please. Another view of the const overall construction, the building that you see is a parking structure that was built as part of this uh, project as well. Next slide. And just a, a one more view of the concession area. You can see the concession area was also will be restored uh, to be a concession area again to grab quick snacks during a game. Next slide. In addition, uh, at this end of the stadium, there was enough space available uh, where a contemporary uh, block utility building uh, was knocked down and this new building approved and constructed that will have an interpretive space on the lower floor and I'm sorry, on the upper floor and on the lower floor, a restaurant that will be permanently open for visitors to be able to get a bite to eat, visit the waterfall and also to uh, learn um, about this, this story. Next, please. As far as the grant um, is concerned, this is the last section that I'd like to show you. This is the Western facade of the stadium. And the grant application was written to, re to rehabilitate this side. Uh, and these are some of the conditions that existed when the grant was put in in 2018. Um, what, the momentum that happened after the grant was made available toward the whole project allowed us to incorporate the grant funding along with the county's funding into the overall project. So the developers are actually um, installing and, and creating the repairs and rehabilitation uh, on this uh, facade uh, right at this time, they're actually doing it. Uh, our next slide will show that. Again, here's some of the ongoing work that is funded by uh, this grant uh, uh, opportunity. This grant uh, was very important to developing the capital stack uh, for the overall project. Although we had anticipated that the grant would be used as part of our pilot demonstration as a way to continue to show commitment to the larger project um, as we were um, working toward um, finding a public partner pr public private partnership that would work for the whole project it worked out that everything moved much quicker and the grant was then held back a bit uh, and then provided as part of the overall funding and was an important part, as I mentioned, of the developer's capital stack uh, in, in figuring how to fund the entire project. Uh, next slide. Another alternative view of the work that's being accomplished with this grant on this facade. You, and this is the another one. And my final slide. Next slide. And this is a wonderful view uh, demonstrating the proximity of the waterfall to the stadium from um, the new building, actually. Uh, so thank you uh, very much again for having me. Uh, it's been uh, really wonderful to share this, uh, this work with you. With our heads down in the trenches so much on all the projects that are going on, we don't often have the opportunity to uh, demonstrate some of our successes. And it's been really great to present this. And I, I hope this was helpful. We could not have done uh, this project together without the assistance of this very particular uh, grant program that was 
uh, a real fit for this for this historic place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane Franco, and for those uh, beautiful photos as well that really helps illustrate uh, the breadth of this project. Thank you. So we've heard wonderful examples of how the HPF is sustaining critical preservation efforts across the country. Now I'm going to discuss the current efforts to reauthorize the Historic Preservation Fund. So federal programs like the HPF need to be reauthorized every so often by the Committee of Jurisdiction. While the Appropriations Committee designates spending levels for each fiscal year, as we discussed earlier, uh, the Authorizing Committee establishes, continues, or even modifies agencies or programs. The HPF is authorized by the House Natural Resources Committee and the corresponding Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. The HPF's current authorization is actually set to expire in September 2023. Representatives Teresa Licker Fernandez of New Mexico and Earl Blumenauer of Oregon in the United States House of Representatives uh, introduced the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act in February 2022. This legislation would permanently authorize funding for the HPF. It would increase its authorization from $150 million to $300 million annually, and it would also ensure that $300 million would be appropriated each year. So if enacted, the legislation would represent the first increase in the HPF's authorized funding level since its inception in 1980. We're so grateful to champions like Representatives Leger Fernandez and Blumenauer for their leadership in legislation like this to make sure that the HPF is around for many, many years to come. We also want to encourage you uh, to encourage your member of Congress to co-sponsor this important legislation. You can ask them to co-sponsor the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act. Uh, you can, uh, right there is HR 6589. You could refer to it to its bill number. Um, it will need to be reintroduced in the next Congress, but we do encourage you to reach out to your members of Congress and tell them why this legislation is important to you and what the HPF means to you and your community. Well, it seems like we're near the end of our time here, but before we wrap up, uh, here's some additional information about staying connected to the National Trust's government relations work. You can visit the Advocacy Resource Center on forum and subscribe to our monthly advocacy newsletter to read the latest in advocacy efforts on the HPF and many, many other historic preservation priorities. My sincere thanks to all of our speakers today, Judith, Nicholas, and John Franco. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your insight, and your successes. As John Franco said, oftentimes there's not enough uh, space to celebrate these successes. And so we're so glad to hear from all of you today. Your work is truly inspiring. And thanks to you for attending this session. If you have any questions about this session, please don't hesitate to contact policy at savingplaces.org. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.